We'll try again. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Because you know it's a gray day and dreary enough. I need a little light and sunshine in here. This morning, my husband brought this in from the garden. This was just a tight bud a few days ago, and now it has fully blossomed into what it is supposed to be. And I thought, what a perfect invitation to bring to you today, both to share its beauty and to wonder what will we blossom into together in this Lenten season. So thank you. Thank you for having me here with you for these next several weeks. And now as we turn to our scripture in the gospel, our second reading today, uh, we find Jesus standing on the banks of the Jordan River just after his baptism of repentance by John, and that is still soaking in. And as he's standing there, the heavens suddenly open, and he hears a familiar voice. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. I can only imagine that in this moment, Jesus experienced an inner transformation and became acutely aware of his identity with God. Now, imagine he could have just ran off and started proclaiming this and seeking praises like, look at who I am. But what did Jesus do next? So let's turn to our reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And hear his story. And again, I invite you to first settle into your seat, into a posture that enables your best listening. To take a deep breath and release what distracts you. To take a deep breath and release what divides you. And as you listen, notice what you hear, notice what you feel, notice what you notice. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and all their authority. For it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone whom I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, by your grace, may the words of my mouth be spoken right. May the meditations of our hearts hear you right. And may in our living go forth from here and live you right. Amen. 
Did anybody watch the Olympics? It kind of seems like a long time ago at this point already. <laughs> you know, I confess, I really didn't see much of it, but I do like the figure skating. And this might come from the fact that I took figure skating lessons when I was in elementary school. And you know, my little red outfit with the faux white fur on the collar and the sleeves, I looked pretty snazzy with this skirt that swirled when I twirled. But alas, as much as I loved my instructor, I really didn't absorb the things that she was teaching me and I didn't practice and I didn't learn any theory and thus I am not a skater. Nathan Chen, on the other hand, he is a skater. Chen first competed in his blue velvet suit when he was three years old. And the moment he stepped on the ice, he was a natural. But still, he needed to practice and strengthen and embody theory in order to live into a world-renowned skater. So heading into the 2018 Olympics, he was favored to win the gold, and he had his eyesight on it. He was consumed by the prize. His face was already on Wheaties boxes, or cornflakes, I think it was, so I don't, you know, misstate. He was also on a billboard in, uh, in um, Times Square. As the gold dangled before him, tempting him with a prize, for his knowledge and his expertise, he crashed and burned. And he finished 17th in the short program. Devastated, devastated, he called his sister with whom he shared a loving relationship and reached out to her for support. And she told him this. She said, I don't want you to think this defines you as a person or what you bring to the sport. And she related in an interview, the next morning he woke up a totally different person. Apparently in that moment, in those mo that moment of loving words, Nathan Chen experienced some kind of inner transformation. And he let go of this temptation of a prize to fully embrace being himself. So with that, did you see his free skate, the long program? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to entertain me for a minute. Because I think the music he chose was no mistake. He started slowly with the music of Elton John, The Yellow Brick Road. The words that go, when are you going to come down? When are you going to land? Goodbye, yellow brick road. You can't plant me in your penthouse. I'm going back to the plow. He skated smoothly and perfectly, executing these quadruple jumps and sow cows and all kinds of specifics that I can't name. But then the music transitioned into Rocket Man. And as the music changed, he, it, it, it went into this crescendo, and as it hit its top, he leapt into this triple, quadruple jump, and he landed perfectly. And in that moment, you could see he was fully himself. He was in the zone. He knew who he was and what he was there to do, and he was confident in it. The gold medal was no longer his prize. He was living into a loving relationship with his sister, with himself. This became his prize. Believing into who he was held way more power than the offer of a transaction. A transaction that if you do the mechanics, if you know the theory, if you make glory the goal, then you get the medal. Now, Jesus, you know, of course we have to come back to Jesus, and we know Jesus wasn't a skater. But Jesus was human. And I understand over the past several weeks, you have been exploring the humanity and the divinity of Jesus with Alex and Seth. So in the past two weeks, the messages came that Jesus fed over 5,000 people. 
And Jesus became dazzling in the presence of Elijah and Moses. That is pretty divine. And I will admit that most of my life, I have found it comforting to think of Jesus as divine. After all, the human standard he set is pretty kind of like out of this world. But last week, last week, Seth said this. The separation between God and humanity is something we have invented on our own. I would suggest that the separation we've invented, that God is there and we are here, is for our convenience. You see, you see, if Jesus is only divine, we can absolve ourselves of some responsibility because, you know, we're not divine. How do we live into that? So we can righteously worship Jesus and thank God we're forgiven when we mess up. Y'all seen that bumper sticker? I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. But if Jesus in his humanity is in complete relationship with God, well, in that case, I think we are challenged to pay closer attention. This Lenten season, I would like to walk with Jesus as the disciples did, following his humanity. Jesus didn't state any doctrines or beliefs, but he lived into a full relationship with God. He boldly surrendered the pride of being right for a relationship of righteousness. Rather than seek his own power, he boldly surrendered to a powerful relationship. Every week on a Sunday, we might state that we believe in God. We even state we believe God's word. But believing into requires surrender to relationship. Surrender of the ease of a transactional faith. A faith that says, if I go to worship on Sunday, I'm good for the rest of the week. If I claim the name of Jesus, I'm, I'm saved for heaven. If I believe a doctrine, then I'm a child of God. Jesus, fully human, did not live a transactional faith but with acute awareness of his identity in relationship with God. In that relationship, acknowledging it and aware of it, he retreated into the wilderness where he wrestled with what it meant to live into that relationship. So rather than go off and seek his praises, he wanders off into the wilderness. In 40 days, he is tempted by the deceiver. That deceiver, friends, that deceiver is a crafty one. We like to name him the devil, but that deceiver is among us today. That deceiver believes in God. That deceiver also believes God's word. Because if you notice in our reading, he used that scripture. He was able to quote it for his own purposes. But I would argue from the story of Jesus' temptation that believing, that believing God and believing in God is not enough. Because James 2, 19 reads, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe. Hmm. I suggest then, it is believing into relationship with God that set Jesus apart from the deceiver. In each temptation, the deceiver used what Jesus believed in to betray his identity and abuse his power. Jesus believed in God. Jesus believed God. But more than that, he was believing into a relationship with God. Now, these three aspects of believing 
believing God, believing in God, believing into God. This triad was first identified by Augustine, a fourth century theologian. He was translating from the common Greek of the early biblical writings when he noted this fascinating grammatical structure. Now, I know you might be saying, oh my God, grammar, but you know, and I'm not usually very excited about it, but bear with me a second, because what he noticed is that what gets translated into English as in or into comes from the Greek n E N or ice, E I S. Now, whether N or ice means in or into depends on whether it's used with an indirect object or a direct object. Simply put, simply put, for those who, of us who struggle, struggle with grammar, this means that the difference between in and into is whether or not there is movement. So this morning, when you got here, you came into the building. You were outside, and you came into the inside. In this moment, you are all sitting in your pews, in your seat. There is no movement at this moment. You're already here. It's a big deal, right? So what? Well, so what until we look at what gets lost in translation. So for the sake of smoothing out awkward phrases from the original Greek and the Latin that was used by Augustine, we lose out on some meaning. So hear this, in Luke 4, verse 1, the NRSV accurately translates the Greek grammar with en, in. And it reads, Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, understood this way, Jesus was already in the wilderness, and the Spirit was leading him. That alone could be a sermon, a promise of the Spirit leading us wherever we already are. Now, compare this to both Matthew and Mark that use the Greek structure with ice. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Spirit took him there. This indicates he was outside the wilderness and the Spirit led him in. Now these phrases make sense, this in and into. But here's another example of ice. In the same grammatic structure, that does not get translated in our English with into. And this might be a familiar verse, so I'm just going to say it instead of telling you what it is. What difference might a translation make? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes into him may not perish but have eternal life. Not just believes him, not believes in him. Believes into him. It's movement. Or how about this? Mark 9, 42, if translated according to the Greek, ice, that structure would read, if you put If any of you put a stumbling block before one of the little ones believing into me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Not someone that believes me, believes in me, but those who are believing into me, if you make them stumble. I guess the deceiver was not aware of this when he sought to make Jesus stumble with his temptations. Believe into me, believing into God. That's an awkward phrase. But what does it beg us to consider about the human Jesus? 
There's a quote on the front of your bulletin by Dr. Natalia Cherry, and she relates from Augustine. It is one thing to believe God exists, another to believe God's promises come true, and still a whole other thing to do what translates as believing into God. Even the demons believe. Like the deceiver, Jesus believed in God. Like the deceiver, Jesus believed God and quoted scriptures. But what set Jesus apart is that he believed into God, into the fullness of his identity with God, with relationship with God. So, I just leave you that, or this, to ponder. What shall we be blossoming into? What shall we become in this Lenten season? If the separation between God and humanity is something we have invented on our own, in this Lenten season, what shall we learn walking with the human Jesus, whom we call the Incarnation? Are we willing to surrender together and find out?